Hi there everyone, my name is Dominic and welcome to What Remains of Edith Finch. Um, this game starts as soon as you hit the start button, so we'll talk more in a moment. Uh, yeah, as you can see, we're right into it, unlike most games, which is a very cool way to start. As soon as you boot up the game on a new game, it just goes into this. So, um, this is a game that I'm very excited to play. I played a long time ago. It was one of the first games I ever played as an adult when I was getting back into gaming, because it was one of the few games that was cheap, because I was so poor, and I had a laptop that couldn't run, like, anything. It had trouble running Portal, so I found this, though, that runs really smoothly and only cost me a few bucks, and it ended up being one of the most affecting emotional story games that I've ever played. So I really wanted to play it for the channel and I think I think the the audience here in the community that I have on my channel will really appreciate it. And will appreciate the kind of story it's going for. So um a very mild trigger warning in that um or maybe not mild again, who knows it's each to one's own. Um the game was not gory or violent by any means, but it deals with death a lot. It's kind of the point of it. It's a, it's a person, and our main character, seeking through a lot of relatives who all die tragically and going through their stories. So there's a lot of very sad shit. It's a very emotional game. It's beautifully handled, though. That's why I want, want to make very clear. It's a very tactful game. It's a very emotionally mature, thoughtful, beautiful experience. I would say, um... I'd say don't shy away from it. I'd say unless you find that it actually is something that would affect your mental well-being negatively, that it's it's a very cathartic game that I found made me emotional, had me, made, gave me a lot of feelings, made me cry when I first played it, but just really settled into my soul by the end of it in a really affecting way. It's why I remember it to this day. So and if you haven't played it, then here's a great exposure to it. It's, it's one that you should definitely play for yourself, but also it's a good one to follow along because there's not really much in the way of gameplay. It's very much a story walking simulator. So anyway, let's go into our journal, all right? Let's see. A lot of this isn't going to make sense to you. And I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to start at the beginning with the house. Also, I'm actually going to pause for a second. I want to make sure the dialogue mix is not too quiet because it's very important that you hear the dialogue, obviously. Uh, Master Volume, good. And the music's gorgeous, but I just don't want it to be too loud compared to the dialogue. Also, you can already see this is our branching path in the journal that we're going to be taking our journey on. So even the start menu here when you go into the pause menu has this beautiful bit of art in it. All right. There we go. All right. Now we can continue. But already, man, this is just, it's a beautiful game. Absolutely gorgeous. I lived here until I was 11, but I wasn't allowed inside half the rooms. This is also from the same studio that made, um, oh, the, 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 the invisible duck. That's not what it's called. The, 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 oh no, the unfinished swan. <laughs> That's the invisible duck. The unfinished swan is what I was trying to think of. Um, so if you like the tone of that, very vibrant and creative and just, uh, you know, just very refreshing storytelling, you will probably like this a lot. Inside the mailbox were bills from seven years ago, marked urgent, open immediately. I hadn't been back since my brother Lewis's funeral. In her will, my mother left me a key, but didn't tell me what it unlocked. Maybe she thought I'd know. Or she thought that the mystery would be enough to bring me back. We go down there. Let's check. I think we're supposed to go up to go get to the house, but I want to make sure and look around. Because, of course, the exploration you do in this game is all... You know, it unveils more story to Edith Finch and her family and all that. So I want to make sure we don't miss anything. There's also a lot of points where I may be a little bit quieter than I usually would in most of my playthroughs because um, this is a very pensive game. It's a very contemplative game. Um, and I want to make sure that tone of it doesn't get lost. You know what I mean? Oh, hold on one sec, everyone. I clicked the wrong button and my on-screen keyboard just popped up for no reason. So hold on, hold on. All right, there we go. The 
The truth is, even after I inherited the house, I never thought I'd come back to it. But now I had questions about my family that only the house knew the answers to. I do like I've seen some um the around the house have always been uncomfortably silent. As if they're about to say something but never do. I may have to go just completely quiet for some of these parts because there's so much dialogue interspersed throughout the experience. Um, but just, uh, I'll pause for just a half a second to say that one thing I think is interesting about a game like this and a lot of storytelling we're seeing is, um, it's an interesting thing to think about when you watch or in engage in any sort of storytelling now, is that the storytelling that we're enjoying now was always the product of the previous generation's life experience, which is to say that I think now you'll, if you notice, I feel like we're getting a lot of content that has to deal with um, people who are dealing with trauma with their parents, trauma with their upbringing, trauma with their communities, um, trauma with the world around them being a more punishing place than maybe it was before, or at least maybe than we realized in generations prior. Um, so I think it's interesting seeing games like this come out that are about loss, that are about death, that deal with themes that were not as present always, especially not in as emotional of a way. Um, in previous eras of, of storytelling and entertainment. Well, there's a reason why you go back 20, 40 years and a lot of stuff that's about- exactly like I remembered it, hmm. the way I'd been dreaming about it. Yeah, God, it's so cool. Such like a Weasley looking kind of house, you know, like, like Weasley's from Harry Potter, like just stacked on top of each other and just crazy looking, but so, so unique. Um, you know what I mean? Like you look back on like films from like the 80s and 90s and it feels like anything that had to do with trauma of any kind, um, we walk down the, the road here because I know they both go to the house, but I don't want to miss if there's any story moments. Plus, it'll give me a chance to chat with you guys about this. Um, it's a walking simulator game anyway, so all we have is time to be able to talk about the story. Um, oh, hey. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, is that the only thing that we, uh, there is to see up on this path? Looks like it. No one had driven this way in a long time, but I saw a few hoof prints. Okay, yeah. So just a couple small things. Um, but I think it's funny you look back on previous generations and stories that are about trauma or loss or whatever were often like revenge stories. And I think you got to think of art. I think a lot of times we think of art as independent from the people who make it. But it's it's never the case, you know? You don't, even if it's something that, like, a director, say, is not writing the script, they're choosing a script, and they're choosing a script that speaks to them. So it speaks to their emotional state, their interest, their point of view on the world. So it's interesting you see old stories that were very much about... The forgiveness was very off the table. They were not very always emotionally rich in that way. You would see a lot of stories about revenge and vengeance and, and justice and all that. And I feel like now we see a lot more stories about making peace with trauma because the trauma went from being this evil source of like, Oh, the, the dangers of the outside world to being like the dangers are often within our own family units. They're trauma from people that we know from parents, from siblings, from aunts and uncles that do harm to us, you know, emotionally, physically, whatever it may be. And that's, we have to make peace with enemies that exist within our own camp, if that makes sense, you know? So I think it's interesting that storytelling starts to reflect that. Even like... As a uh, child, the house made me uncomfortable in a way I couldn't put into words. But even in like... Um, As a 17-year-old, I knew exactly what those words were. Hmm. I was afraid of the house. Yeah. Let's explore the outside a bit before we go in further, but... Um, you know, even movies like Turning Red, you know, the Disney film, like that's one that's like so much about uh, parent trauma and lack of connection and authenticity, I think, you know, between a parent and a child, um, uh, as well as films like if you watch like um, Everything Everywhere All at Once, that is so much a parent trauma movie that's about like, hey, you're existing in a way that your generation existed, which is closed off and you think that's a strength. But it's a weakness. It's making you less able to be able to live a life that's fulfilling because you're trying to be right all the time and you think that's positive, that's a strength. You know, I think of that a lot where I think in previous generations there was this notion of like, if I'm the parent, I can't show quote unquote weakness, you know? And that means I never, whatever I say is right, no matter what, I never admit that I was wrong. But it's like, that's not impactful in a positive way. That just makes you seem inhuman as a parent versus going to your child and being able to connect to them and say, Hey, I, I make mistakes. I'm flawed. I am 
someone who I am human. I do make, you know, mistakes. I'm going to check the backyard really quick. I don't want to miss anything before we go into the house because the house obviously has so much story stuff. Um, you know what I mean? I think it is interesting that that has become more and more present in storytelling because the generation who lived through those traumas now is growing up and they're the ones working at studios and they're the ones writing the scripts and telling the stories. Um, in the same way as, you know, a lot of war films came out 20, 30 years after World War II because the kids who served... something moving around in the garage. I was going to say, I heard that too. I don't, I'm like, I don't think it's anything scary. I don't remember this game really... This game has some spooky moments, I guess, but really that's the extent of it from my recollection. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, you, you look in the years afterwards, you know, World War II and the generation that survived that, you know, those stories became woven into the movies 20 years later. There's usually, you can really mark it as like there's a 20 year gap between- I hope the key might unlock the front door. No. It didn't. Yeah, can we peek through there? Looking in. I felt like the house itself had been waiting for me. God, I love this so much. It's so much almost like, um, it's like a visual poem almost. Uh, maybe that key lets us through the, um, the side door. We just had to check the front first. Uh, but anyway, that's something I, I think about that a lot, about how, um, cause I've heard it phrased that art is an interesting thing when you think about it as art is a journal entry of the people who make it from their time, you know? Can I, oh, can I crawl through there? Oh, there we go. That'll work. Crawling through the doggy door used to be a lot easier when I was 11. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like art's, you know, one of those things that exist, you know, uh, as a reflection of the person's state of being at the time, you know, what they're going through, what they're feeling, especially good art, you know, because good art connects to you in an emotional way. The night we left. For the first time in years, felt like I was home. Like two elder coats hanging up. That's the fascinating thing about this, I think, too, is telling a story in a way that it's all centers around this one house, and the house is so lived in because, of course, it's telling a story through that. But instead of a family, there were just memories of one. Yeah. Lewis Finch. Like how after Lewis started working at the cannery, we all got sick of eating salmon. Mm. Except our cat, Molly. Mm. Or how only one restaurant would deliver to our house. <laughs> so we had Chinese a lot. Uh, this is also, I talk about storytelling a lot, obviously it's one of my core passions in life. This game, I will say just, you know, I think, and you'll, I'm sure you'll attest to this after going through this experience with me, but, um, there's a lot of talk about how in storytelling you want to go vertical, not horizontal. And by that, I mean horizontal storytelling is where you make the world bigger. More people, more characters, more lands, more factions, more everything. You know, just expand it, expand it, expand it. And that's not a bad thing. That can make a very fascinating world. But if it's if you're not developing it vertically, which is depth of character, depth of connection and, and relationships between characters and history to that world it's not going to feel very meaningful. And this game is the epitome of like, this takes place all about one small, one family in one house. And that's enough because it's so vertically rich. It's so historically, it has so much historical depth to the character and the relationships. The table was still a wreck from the night we left. It's funny, playing this again, because uh, I haven't played this since I played it so long ago. It reminds it me like a lot. Mom had gone off. Killing everyone but sparing the furniture. Mm. But it's, it reminds me a lot of The Haunting of Hill House in not as creepy, but in the tone of being a family being kind of unraveled by circumstances beyond their control. My mom was the only one of us who could imagine Great Grandma Edie living in a nursing home. That's a weird thing, too, talking about um, the, per, you know, the generational gap between most of us and a lot of parents and grandparents we have is. The difference of like parents who can be disconnected emotionally through your entire life, but then when it comes when they're getting older, they're like, oh, but you're going to take good care of me, right? You're going to make sure. And it's like, mm, it becomes hard to receive that notion a lot of times when you go, yeah, but, you know, when I think, you know, you hear so many stories of so many people 
growing up with parents who were like, yeah, but you're so, you should be grateful that I keep food on the table and a roof over your head. And it's like, that's not a gift. That's not even Nothing good enough. It looked abnormal. There was just too much of it, like a smile with too many teeth. I was like, this is like, because like I've mentioned before that I would love to get into game development. And if I was to make the a game. The fireplace had a story. Edie told me the bricks came from the original house after it sank. But like, if I was ever to get into game development, I would love. Oh, nice! I like that. The text going out of the like, like the smoke going out of the chimney. Um, but if I was ever to try to make him, I would love to start with something like this because I think the scope of it would be more manageable. You know, to be able to do a story-oriented game. But uh, they're also, I think, they're the ones I enjoy the most. You know, that's why even a game like um, games like The Last of Us and all of that. So many of us, you know, we play them because they have so much cool stuff in combat and all that. But well, that's not the core Great reason we're there. Built a music box for Barbara, along with the rest of the house. Mm. Yeah, that's this is Barbara Finch. Yeah, that's right. That was the little, the little movie starlet in the family. So our key go to here. Told me to stay out of the basement, so I wasn't too surprised when the key didn't fit. Fair enough. All right, we'll get back around there soon. What's this room and why is it? I forget a lot of the story stuff too. I remember the larger story moments, but this will be fun for me too because it'll be very fresh. Because I really, again, I played this so long ago that I remember very little. Mom sealed up all the bedrooms. Mm. Then Edie retaliated and drilled peepholes. My grandpa Sam spent seven years sharing a room with his dead brother, Calvin. As a kid, I just assumed every house had peepholes and sealed rooms you weren't allowed inside of. <laughs> Man, so much pink. This is like my Nana's house has a bathroom like this that is just pink top to bottom. That talk about a generational difference. That's one of those where I'm like, that was, I know that was the height of fashion when she had it done like that. The last time I was in Edith Sr.'s room, I was 10 and she was painting my portrait. I spent a lot of time playing in Great Uncle Walter's room. I think my mom sometimes regretted not sealing it up. You know what's something too that I think is a, a difference in, I think you can really mark people who have better home lives and relationships with their parents is if your parents let you explore your creativity, like things like this, like painting the walls or whatever, like, sorry, this seems to get me emotional because, uh, you know, my life's had a lot of ups and downs. I don't talk a lot about them in the channel and in my work all that much. But, um, you know, I see this stuff and I just think like, this is what a childhood is supposed to be, you know? Like, there's no... There's no argument to be made for saying, you know what, let's paint the walls and put stuff up and, and let it have let life be more silly and less serious because we can always paint the walls again when we leave, you know? You know, making a kid feel like they can't express themselves because of some adult reason is such a silly thing to me when that's such an enriching thing to be able to have if you can have a parent who brings that sense of playfulness to a childhood that kid's going to grow up so much more enriched and so much more thoughtful and so much more open, I think. The constantly feeling, because that's where it starts, you know, the, the way we suppress our own creativity starts young. And it starts with things like, can I can I decorate, can I paint a picture on my wall and all that? You know, and sometimes there's practical reasons a parent might say no, obviously. You can't in, engage in every whim that a child wants, you know. But there's a lot of scenarios, I think, where more kids would do so much better with a compassion response to be like, you know what? It's just paint. It's just a wall. It's not, no damage is being done. There's no harm in it and all that. And saying no only tells that kid, oh, okay, life already is starting to have limits on it. You know, even though I'm not harming anyone, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just inconvenient to be creative, you know? And I think that can be so damaging down the road. There were secret passages, but I never believed him. Turns out, 
Turns out my mom was really good at keeping secrets. That's so cool. Now it was time to find out what my mom had been afraid of. From the paintings on the wall, it was clear my brother Milton had been here before me. That's funny, as silly as it might sound, this is another reason I do, like would love the idea of having enough money to be able to have a big house, you know, and, and some point soon in my life. And it's less the status of having a big house and being able to show it off, as much as it's having the room creatively to be able to make it my own, to be able to make it whatever I want, to be able to add Maybe additions, it's, you know. It sounds like I had a plan, but I had no idea what was behind that door. Just like I had no idea where all this was going to lead. I grew up looking at Molly's room through the peephole. Molly's gerbil had a tiny bedroom with its own even tinier <laughs> gerbil cage. That's so cute, honestly. Mount Rainier. That's right, because I know it's like, I'm assuming they're somewhere in Washington. I, I don't think I pieced that together last time, but of course, you know, with Mount Rainier and, and all the indications, and that it's just like a gloomy overcast kind of place it makes sense Inside, so for the first time i felt like i'd stepped behind a painting <laughs> can we grab this the squid no oh, okay all right can't go through there yet what's through here I got this there we go he had spent a lot of time here that's before right before my mom sealed the doors that's right. I forgot because she was only uh, she was only ten when she passed. Oh, I'm preemptively getting sad because this is a very sad story. But hey, you know what? I know my audience here is a bunch of mentally ill, depressed bitches. All right, myself included. So we probably could all use a good cry together. All right, better to do it on our own terms than uh, because of what life throws at us. So you know, give yourself a good cry. You probably need it. <laughs> Molly Finch, yeah. December 13th, 1947. Dear Diary, I'll be gone soon, but I wanted to tell somebody about what's going to happen. It started when Mom sent me to bed without dinner. I woke up and I was starving, so I looked around for something to eat. The gerbil food was dry, but I didn't mind it. My Halloween candy was all gone. Oh, poor baby. Mom, can I come out now? Sweetheart, it's late. Go to sleep. about eating Christopher, but I held back. <laughs> Christopher, thank goodness. <laughs> he said she was not in the mood for sushi that day. Anything else here for the moment? No. That's so dark. There we go. Even this, like, Having us be so little, having our POV be from the perspective of a little kid that like we can barely see over the sink. I kept eating and eating. Oh, poor baby. <sighs> Sorry, you're going to see me more emotional than I am in most of my playthroughs. Because every time I see this stuff, um, I have a very soft spot for stories about this kind of stuff. Because I'm just like, the world needs to be so much kinder to kids. You know, the amount of times I just think about how many times, you know, just in general, just from not even just like all just my own experience, but just other people I talk to where it's I just think I'm like, man, there's so many times where it's like, would it really have cost that much more to be able to say, OK, you know what? It's late, but you can get out, get out of bed and have a snack, get out of bed and come watch a, a movie with mom and dad or whatever it is, you know, like so many things where the rule setting that we've seen from previous generations led to so much isolation, I think made it so much harder to connect with people later, you know? I ate a lot of things that night. <sighs> Aren't those like poisonous? Like, 
assuming. Then I heard chirping outside my window. It was a barn swallow going back to her nest. I reached out for her. And suddenly, <laughs> I was a cat. <laughs> I do love this. So just the just it's so it's just an imaginative way to tell a story. There we go. I tried to be quiet, but the bird was really scared. Mom and Dad didn't even look at me. I could tell she was getting really tired. Yeah, where'd you go? There you are. Now I was up in the big tree. I promised Dad I wouldn't climb it anymore. All I cared about was eating that mama bird. I gobbled her up. And suddenly, I was an owl. First, all I heard was the wind. Then I heard little teeth nibbling in the grass. I'm assuming we're looking for a little mouse treat. Oh, that's right. We can like swoop down to be able to grab our prey. There's one. I imagined his face looking up and seeing mine through my talons. I swallowed him up and I didn't chew one bit. And then I flew off to find something bigger. A mama rabbit. She was almost too big to carry. I started choking, but I couldn't stop eating. And suddenly, I was a shark. I like that we don't transition into being a shark in the water. We're just a shark here. And then all we can do is just flop around. I Oop. rolled off the cliff and into the ocean. There we go. Now, I was hungrier than ever. Snack! Snack! Come back here, come back here, come on. I grabbed on tight. Oh, when I was so hungry, I jumped out of the water. When I opened my eyes, everything had changed. Oh, okay, we're like pulling ourselves along, that's right. I do like because there's a little octopus toy on her bed. And I smelled people everywhere. So I'm pretty sure all of this stuff is reflective of, of toys and stuff in her room. That she's like hallucinating this story as she's eating all the stuff she's not supposed to eat. Which is so sad. I 
I was big, but I moved real quiet. I wanted to stop, but also I didn't. Just gonna go visit the captain for a little bit. A snack! Is it... Is there more in here? Oh, that's right. We haven't gotten to the captain yet. That was just the first mate. That was just the appetizer course. As passenger, I was still hungry. And across the water, I smelled something new. Something I had to have. So I swam towards it. There we go. I slithered onto the sand, and the good smell went into an old pipe. Oh, we're in the shitter. Lovely. They'll never expect that. Ooh. The controls for swimming around the room are a little bit weird. I want to go... There we go. There we go. I got closer and closer. Are we back in... Yeah, we're back in our little room. All my stomach started growling. And suddenly, I was me again. I held my breath for a long time, but I couldn't hear anything. I think it's waiting for me to fall asleep. But it's not going to wait much longer. It needs to be, and we both know I will be delicious. That is too much trauma for a little little kid. I'm not sure if I believed all of that, but I'm sure Edie would have. Yeah, such a sad notion that you're just like recounting all the uh, all the loss that went you know it went through this whole family. This will be obvious later, but. My mom never told me any of these stories. Edie would have, but mom didn't like bringing up the past. Though, when we adopted a stray kitten, she was the one who named it Molly. I spent a lot of time in Great Grandma Edie's room. Her room was like a museum. Mysteries of Death Thereafter. Odin Finch. I don't think I ever noticed that, that that was... Huh. Yeah, I'm assuming this is another uh, family member, yeah. Yeah, it's like a shrine. Okay, yeah, Odin, 1880 to 1937. Okay, it's so one of the older family members who was an author. And all the handprints. Even this, too, like this, this grandma who was clearly very proud of all of them, clearly very connected. Lewis died a week before we left. Edie had already started to memorialize him. Edie knit me a new pair of gloves every year, just in time to replace the old ones. Hmm. For 500 years, the Finches have been famous throughout Norway for their fortune and misfortune. Odin Finch buries the latest victims of the family curse his wife, Ingeborg, and their newborn son, Johan. On January 7th, 1937, he set sail with his family and his house, hoping to leave the curse behind. But 40-foot waves off the coast of Washington send the house and Odin to the bottom of the sea. Odin's daughter, Edie, 
with husband Sven and baby Molly, step ashore on their new home, Orcas Island. Odin Finch is the first to be buried in the new family cemetery. His daughter Edie is already dreaming of a new Finch house. Yeah. What a cool way to be able to tell the story too. This is something I think is so fascinating is... Whatever's wrong with this family, it goes back a long ways. And yeah, like some of some of the people in like the um the family get such long narrative moments, and some of them are just just little details you find because they're older, you know. They're people that um, you know, in the story we're not as familiar with. Sven and Edie built nineteen thirty seven. Sven Finch. When Edie told people Sven was killed by a dragon. She could also have said he was building a dragon-shaped slide that collapsed. <laughs> she could have, but she didn't. That's a cooler story, to be fair. Like that's a that's feels referential to um or in re or in reference, I should say, to um there was a real there was a sculptor or something who was doing a giant sculptor that a part of it collapsed and fell and killed him, and then the like the structure was mostly finished, so now it's this like morbid um art installation because it killed the one who made it one summer they evacuated the island but Edie refused to go for a few weeks she was a celebrity see thankfully for me uh, the art i do doesn't really have a high uh possibility of of harm unless my laptop explodes one day but you know probably not <laughs> i hadn't thought of myself as edith jr for a long long time Edie gave a big interview about a mole man living under the Finch house. My mom was furious. <laughs> Edie was just telling stories. <laughs> Lurpy. Oh, that's interesting. They're little memorials to all the birds. That's actually sweet. Like, I like the idea that they get, like, they get a little portrait painted of them to memorialize them. That's a very sweet way to remember a pet if you're artistic, you know? I still want to get, um, I had a cat growing up called Max for many years, um, that really, and he was the first, real first pet that was mine, you know, like we had other dogs and all that when I was smaller, they didn't really have a say in, but Max was the first one that was like, that was my kitty, um, passed away a few years ago. Um, and he's one though, I would love to memorialize, he's one I would love to get a tattoo, just like a little painterly 2D kind of tattoo of just his face with his markings on it. That's when I look back and I'm like, yeah, that's. You know, those things are special, you know? Those are Even in their 90s. core memories, you know? Edie seemed a lot younger than my mother. That's also the funny thing, too, is when you the hear... The only trace Grandpa Sam's first wife, Kay, left on the house was the pink bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that makes more sense, all right? A pretty big trace. <laughs> a little hard to miss, that's for sure. There's a secret in this bathroom. It's in the last place you would look. It isn't in the cupboard. It's hidden in this book. That's so cool. Nice, nice. Sven gave Sam an old camera he'd refurbished. He never put it down. I want to double check so we're about to go into a different story part. I just want to make sure there's not something significant I missed back in, in grandma's room over here. It's such a beautiful story that I really do want to make sure I'm not missing any little tidbits because there are so many great little, um, you know, story things and little uh, character details throughout the game. Okay. Is there anything over by the uh, the door here? I don't think so. I think we got all of it. The game does a very good job of presenting the information in a very logical way so you don't miss story moments, but I just wanted to double check. All right, yeah, I think we're good. All right. Let's see. Oh, yeah, all the kids' toys. Oh.
like the idea that he used this uh, this part of the wall as a little dark room. It's a cool idea. That's right. Cause I gotta forget. Were these two twins? Twin. Yeah. Okay. And that he never talked about him. That's right. Cause what are the two? That's right. Cause uh, of course. Cause I, I love this too. So I'm just gonna like this visual is so cool. The idea that like these two twins are such opposite spirits, and one is is all space and exploration and beyond this planet, and this one's all it's nature and photography and it's everything about the world here. You know. Also, these, these rooms are also just cool as fuck. Like, the design of them. Like, man, these are the coolest kid rooms I've ever seen in my life. I guess my grandpa didn't like history any more than my mom did. <laughs> How I Want to Remember My Brother by Sam Finch. The thing I remember is that when he made up his mind, that was it. My brother said he'd die before he ate another mushroom. And he did. At Barbara's funeral, we swore we'd never be afraid again. And he wasn't. I think Calvin always wanted to fly. Sam! Calvin! Get on, Sammy! Coming! But that day, he finally made up his mind to do it. I told him going around was impossible. Maybe if I hadn't said that. Alvin, I'm not gonna tell you again. Maybe if the wind hadn't picked up. Then maybe he'd still be here. But I doubt it. I think he'd already made up his mind. That's what I want to remember about my brother. The day he made up his mind to fly. And he did. story felt strangely familiar yeah, when old? I was younger I remember trying to do the exact same thing yeah because how old yeah 11 okay <sighs> after the funeral Edie roped off Calvin's half of the room Mom said Grandpa Sam enlisted at 18 and never set foot in the room again. I can't imagine, too, I mean, being close to any, like, sibling, like, but especially, like, a twin who you're that close to, to pass away in such a tragic way. Like, it's obviously, again, like, the pain of losing something under any circumstance is just so, you know, it's such a deep thing. What's this one? That's so cute. <laughs> That's such a cute idea. Also, just the ingenuity of this game in terms of like the the design of it is so cool. Is it a push? Oh, yeah, that's right. It like lifts out of the way. Ugh, so cool. I'd love to have a house like this, just full of little passageways and secrets and little hidden areas and and not for any ju just guys. They'd obviously been built for smaller hands and bellies. Uh, don't want to go back up there. I wish I can come back in here if I unlock this. That just goes into the main area of the house, right? Let me see. Yeah, it just kind of unlocks that. So, all right, let's we'll go back in here and go around. Growing up, I always thought of Barbara as a child star.
I never thought about how hard it must have been for her afterwards. Of all the stories people wrote about Barbara's death, I'm surprised Edie saved this one. Old Jack here with another ghastly tale inspired by America's most unfortunate family. I'm calling it The Surprise Ending of Barbara Finch. As a child star, Barbara was famous for her scream. Now at 16, she was all washed up. A has-been. But in a lucky break, she'd been asked to perform her signature scream at a local convention for monster movie fans. It was just the boost her career needed. Unfortunately, her scream hadn't aged well. <laughs> Getting better. I think you just need the right motivation. Her biggest fan and current boyfriend, Rick, was about to demonstrate when... Now that was a great scream. It was Barbara's father, Sven. He'd slipped into a table saw and had to be rushed to the emergency room. So Barbara got stuck babysitting her youngest brother, Walter. Her convention comeback was canceled. Okay, I'm hearing frustration, but I'm not hearing terror. What if I tried... A gang of hoodlums and Halloween masks have been terrorizing Orca's Island tonight. Police are urging residents to... You're right. Also, I loved your delivery on that. <laughs> Why is your basement door locked? Because my dad likes making puzzles and secret passages. There's a key hidden in the music box. The secret is to keep winding and winding until finally the key pops out. Oh. All right, that's what we'll be that's what we'll be doing next, I guess. 20 minutes later, Rick hadn't returned. So Barbara went to look for him, right on cue. She reached for the music box. And as she wound the key, she listened for Rick, but the house was silent. I'm controlling it now. I like the Halloween theme playing. Oh no, I'm gonna have to mute that, won't I? Cause scratch and imagine the worst. Alright, I'm just gonna keep talking over the Halloween music because maybe then it won't get copyright claimed. Oh no, talking, talking, talking. Oh, I have this thing to whack the monsters with. That's nice. Alright, it's right out here. Come on, where are ya? Come on. Whack! The gang's leader is the infamous Come on. Man killer, Dr. Carl Hamill, who impaled and then ate his family ten years ago tonight. Okay. I like like the pop art comic book style too. Again, such a cool way to present a story, honestly. Come on. I got it. I'm gonna bonk him. Alright, bonking. Bon ah! Oh dear. Oh shit. Oh Well, you should have scared me. <laughs> Barb, relax. damn it, Rick. I was just trying to scare you to help you find your scream. Oh, thank I'm you. Not scared, Rick. I'm furious. Then act furious. All I'm getting from you now is that you're hurt and confused and you She threw him out, but she kept a little something to remember him by. Barb, have you seen my other crutch? And she was still holding it when she fell asleep watching the late, late picture show. Hours later... Barbara! Walter, what's going on up there? Okay, I'm coming up, but if this is a trick, you're dead, Walter. No, not the copyrighted music, no. The true nightmare of a game is having copyright claimed music. All right. See, I got my, my, got my bonkins tick, though. I'm ready. Oh. Uh. 
Oh, hold on. Sorry, my, my computer's glitching again. There we go. All right. Okay, there we go. Oh, is that not the way? Oh, the, the open door, perhaps. Walter, are you there? Walter, he vanished. But his bedside radio was still on. Orcas Island police describe the man as six feet tall with a steel hook for a hand. Residents are urged to lock all doors and windows and notify the police of any suspicious activity. Ruh -roh. Returned, saw the hook man and was speechless. He was quite smashing. And he was, he couldn't get enough. Okay, Barbara, there's got to be another way out of here. Fuck you, clown. All right. Oh, the window, maybe. Uh, oh, duh, there's a secret passageway. That's right. That night, she played her part beautifully. I'm like, let me guess. It's like one of her family members, right? Oh, had vanished. Maybe not. For his breathing, but all she heard was. Monsters they were, and she realized what was about to happen. She was going to be famous. <laughs> and with her final breath, Barbara Finch gave the performance of her life. I wasn't there myself, but I hear Barbara was magnificent. Poor girl. She had a taste for stardom. But unfortunately, so did her fans. Of course, the police blamed it all on poor Rick, who disappeared the same night. And little Walter? Hiding under his bed the whole time. He took it all pretty hard. But that's another story. As for Barbara, tucked inside the music box is all they ever found of her. Her ear. Ugh. Now that's what I call eerie. Ear. Yeah, yeah. Make that pun, <laughs> pumpkin man. You it... told me all Barbara wanted was to be remembered, as absurd as that comic was. Maybe what Edie saw was a happy ending. Well, hey, he definitely got remembered, that's for sure. Still so sad, though, like, let's see, how old for Barbara? Yeah, 16, okay. Oh. There's, something, there's something so somber about all the, um, Oh yeah, all the Seattle like plays that she was at. 
Um, something so somber about all the um, just the memories left behind when someone passes. You know, that's why death is such a sad thing because we're left with all these vestiges of the person. You know. All right, I'm assuming we're, we're good to go here. I think we got everything. Yeah. But now we know we can go down to the basement, though. I guess now I know why mom didn't like me playing with the music box. <laughs> okay. Oh, what's this? Edie's father, Odin, built the original house. All right, where was the music box? Was it... Uh, it's downstairs, right? Yeah, because it goes hey, to the basement. All those times I played with the music box and never found the basement key. Monsters left. Hey, demons, it's your boy. Mom said the basement was off limits, unless I wanted another tetanus shot. I saw Edie sneak down to the basement once. Carrying packages. See, all I want to know is what is the square footage on this house? Because, my God. I thought maybe she was hiding presents. Is it a secret passageway? Ha ha ha! Turned out she was hiding a lot more than that. <sighs> that was dark as fuck. There we go. about where Walter had gone. She said after Barbara died, he got as far away as he could. If there's a pattern in all these stories, I think it's that none of us has gotten very far. Yeah. Walter, what, he's 53? Goodbye, everyone. I can't believe I've been down here for 30 years. I well, was just down here for three decades? The shaking started. I didn't think I'd survive a week. But after a few days, I settled into a routine. That's what kept me sane. Having a schedule, living for today. I always expected to be dead tomorrow. But if you wait long enough, you get used to anything. All right, the last calendar was what, in the 60s? This is like 10 years later, he's still doing this? How malnourished would you be from having the same the canned monster. goods over and over? The other side of the door starts to feel normal. Almost friendly. And then one day, everything just stopped. Whatever that thing was, it was gone. Maybe it got tired of waiting. Or maybe I just got tired of being afraid. I like the detail of the liver spots on his hands and arm getting more intense as he ages. It's been a week now, the longest in 30 years. I'm done waiting. I have to leave while well, I still can. Yeah, time to go live your life. Didn't wait too long at all. All right, which way are we going? Oh, there we go. Through the bunker. It's out there somewhere. Whatever killed Barbara and Molly. 
Oh, he was scared of the curse. That makes more sense. And Calvin. Well, that's a little more reasonable after seeing that many family members disappear. A mistake. But I need to stop living the same day. Even if it kills me. Whatever's out there, I want you to know I'm ready for it. Is he about to get hit by a train? I'm going to appreciate all of it, especially the food. I don't mind if I only have a year left. Or a month. Or a single week. I'd be happy with one real day. I can already imagine the sun on my face. Oof. Walter had just had a little more situational awareness. He might have had uh, a little more time on this uh, on this earth. Yeah, he died when I was six. I can't believe my mom never told me he was down here. Yeah, it would be a little weird to be able to be like, oh yeah, him? Don't worry about him. I'm sure my mom was trying to protect me. Well, and if only he hadn't built his trap door right next to the train tracks. Maybe she was afraid I'd end up like Walter. But if she never told me about an uncle under the house, I can only imagine what else she was hiding. I don't want to make the same mistakes she made. Trying to bury something that's still alive. Now that there's only one of us left, or maybe two, I thought it was time I heard the stories for myself and found out what happened to everyone else. But now I'm worried the stories themselves might be the problem. Maybe we believed so much in a family curse, we made it real. There is something weird to be said for that, is this self-fulfilling self sense uh, when you feel, if you if you tell yourself my life's cursed and everything's down on me, writing this. Uh, but you know what I mean. Like you, if you really put that self into your brain, your brain will you'll interpret everything in that in that way. Maybe you know. Be better if all this just died with me. That's why I talk a lot about in various places. You know, is the but importance. I you should know about your family. Yeah. and the history you're a part of. I like that little adjustment that realizing that she's the only reason she's seeking this out is because she's writing to someone, you know? Can we... What's that thing glowing way out there? I forget. I'm assuming we can't go visit it yet, so all right. Though, to be honest, I feel as lost as you probably do right now. I think the people in these stories believed them, for what that's worth. We go down here, anything worth looking at? No. History of imagination and stubbornness and madness. Any of it seems possible. It's such an interesting thing, too, like in terms of game design. Making a story this. I think um, we've been surrounded by death for so long, we've just gotten used to it. A story this interwoven, all featuring such a 
contained location and finding a way that's not just you going one room at a time, you know, in a very painfully linear way, finding ways to journey what through. Kind of family finishes building a cemetery before starting the house. Well, you know, sometimes you gotta you gotta bury a dead. You gotta make room for all your old relatives. I admit this, but the pet cemetery may be more uncomfortable than the human one. Well, did you Three see the movie? Those were mine, and two had been my fault. Well, that's honest view. What are the names? Hold on, we got Zerpy, Lurpy, Furpy, Chirpy, Burpy, Derpy, and Derpy Junior. Very nice. Sven built the house, but it was Edie who designed the cemetery. It's cool the idea that every one of their little gravestones has something special. Oh, that's sad. The little like flying kitty for for Molly. Yeah, for Calvin the rocket. Yeah. What's, what's this? Hold on. Oh, that's cool. I don't know if I noticed that, that it's like a little, uh, little peephole into this little, um, or like a little diorama. I'm sure Odin's monument had been Edie's idea. My mom was always trying to move on, but for Edie, the past never went away. She could see it poking out of the water at low tide. Edie said she dreamed about the old house every night. All right, is that it for the moment? I don't want to miss anything, but I think so. Edie's side was always easier for me to understand. But the older I get, the more I can see where my mom was coming from. Her dad had been pretty strict, but it wasn't enough to save her brothers. She was just trying to do better. She lost two of her brothers, just like I did. I get why she tried so hard to protect us. so many things I wish I could ask my mom now. Part of me thinks this is what she wanted all along. For me to come back someday and find everything out for myself. But looking back on it now, If she told me there was going to be so much climbing, I never would have come when I was 22 weeks pregnant. There it is. There's the little plot revelation that she's doing all of this because she's pregnant and wants to understand her family because she's got a kid on the way. Which makes it so much more somber because she's trying to live her life, but also with the weight of being like, am I only introducing a kid who has a curse on the family? So, but it's... It's a beautiful story that she's trying to understand. But I think he and my mom had a lot in common. Yeah, it's like a beautiful notion of her trying to seek out her family history to try to understand it and make peace with it. That way she can move beyond it, I think, in her own journey as a parent. They were both pretty intense. Yeah, what's the year, Sam? Uh, 1950 to 1983. Okay. Dawn, I promise you'll never forget this weekend. Yes, sir. These memories are going to last a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Am I going to have to shoot anything? 
It's a hunting trip, Don. Shooting is strongly encouraged. Perfect. <laughs> it's gonna rain the whole weekend, isn't it? Please just take the damn picture. Hey, language. <laughs> Did you want to get a picture of me or what? Well, hold on, where are you? I'm zooming in too far. There we go, that's how I zoom out, okay. I will never forget this weekend, Dad. That's the spirit. Okay, got it. I'm gonna take some pictures, okay? Just be careful, that camera's older than you are. Hmm. Definitely should not have drunk. Hey! <laughs> that's a keeper. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm not always gonna be here, Don. You'll need to remember this stuff if you want to survive. I'll be fine, Dad. You know who else thought he was going to be fine? Some guy who. Dad! Good eyes, Don. Before you take the shot, let me get a picture of you. Let me get behind you. Do I have to do this? Don, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to survive, you'll need to be strong. Now keep yourself squared up, elbows down, like we practice, whenever you're ready. Great shot, Don! <laughs> I'm proud of you, Don. Always remember that, okay? Dad, it's twitching. I think That's it's totally so normal, Don. Just focus on the camera. Try not to think about Dad! it. stories that's the one I wish most that my mom had told me oh sad 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 Sam spent his life shooting photos but mom said he got nervous being in front of the camera I guess we're all afraid of something this like what what year because let's see he was alive 50 to 83 so what Vietnam yeah would have been Vietnam. Oh man. Getting here. Yeah, all of his medals and everything. Instead of hiding from death, Sam seemed to go out of his way to meet it. Let's say the airline ticket to where? I can't quite make it out. Let's see. I guess the idea that he was just traveling everywhere though, both for his like his military time and then later. After Sam died, my mom and Edie got really close. They'd both lost a lot. Oh, that's fine. I was going to split this into multiple parts, but I'm thinking I may just play this through because it's meant to be a pretty continuous experience. So, uh, just means you'll have to forgive me if I have to go take a bathroom break part way through. Between Kay and Sam Finch. Okay. Dear Kay, do you remember the way Gregory used to laugh when he thought he was alone? Like something funny was happening, but only he could see it. <sighs> I think he saw things the rest of us don't. Thank you. 
<laughs> like the whale's watching, you know, it's like the whale's eyes moving. Knock the whale down to become part of it. Flip the uh, the whale over. He's stuck. There we go. There we go. Oh, can we knock these down? Okay. Trying to get up on top of the whale. There we go. <laughs> so this reminds me of like old like PS like PS1 kind of games, you know, with this kind of this kind of silly puzzle solving. gets me so so hard because it's one of those it wasn't your fault yeah it's just like such a horrible mistake but it's complete like it's obviously an accident like I'm sure it's happening and he'd want you to be happy too good luck <sighs> love Sam I think that they were already like having some trouble and all of that and that like of course kind of sealed the deal I'm assuming after then their kid passed away so tragically oh man yeah oh, Gregory was only one <sighs> I think it's one of the hardest because it's like that's like the one where it's like, like you know the where both the parents you know you know they like suffered for the rest of their lives and all that over something that was just just an accident you know Ugh. Ugh. I my mom ever writing poetry and yet I will say I do like that this is such a tactful story that even that the loss of like a child like that is handled in a really beautiful way as as like sad fucking sad and heartbreaking as that is like it's still done so thoughtfully A poem for Gus <laughs> who always said the wedding was a bad idea <laughs> Our father never hit us kids at least not very hard before the day my brother said with teenage disregard that he'd be dead before he'd see a wedding in our yard.
My father made him come, of course, but Gus stood far apart, just flew his kite and bottled up the storm inside his heart. I tried to talk him out of it, but though he'd never met her, we don't need a stepmom, were the words that I remember. I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. Are there more words over these words? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. There we the time go. The photos came, Dad ordered him to come, come here. here. But Gus declined and as a sign held up his middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> the wind picked up and panicked geese appeared and quickly went. But all the humans did that day was go inside the tent. Rain came down in buckets then, but no one seemed afraid that nature might destroy the tent our dad had crudely made. The thunder sounded much too close and full of angry power, but all my father said to this was, Make the music louder. I wish that I could truly say I thought about you on that day. Out there on the beach alone, just you, the wind, the sea, and foam. But I didn't, until we found you. <sighs> yeah, how old was Gus? What? 13, okay. She never talked about him, but mom told me once if I was a boy, they were going to name me Gus. <sighs> All right, where are we going now? Oh, climbing wall up. My mom moved up to the loft after her brothers died. At the time, it was as far away as she could get. <sighs> she spent a summer building houses in Calcutta. Where she met my dad, Sanjay. Yeah, she was like the studious one of the family. My mom moved to India a week after graduation and got a job teaching English. I'll head out there in a second. Uh, oh yeah. Religion was another thing my mom never talked about, but I think it helped her a lot after her dad died. Lewis was born a year later. When my dad died, I don't think mom knew where else to go. I'm sure Edie was happy to have her back. And to see kids in the house again. The house had to get a little bigger, but Edie was used to that. And for a while, Things were good. Almost normal. Such a cute little classroom. Hmm. But it didn't last. The beginning of the end was Milton's 10th birthday, when Edie gave him a castle. After Milton disappeared, the only thing he left behind was a room full of paintings. Oh, hey, I didn't notice that's the frog from The Unfinished Swan. I do like that they tend to put references to their other games, um, you know, in, in games like this. They find nice, and, and they're very subtle ones. I know there's some game references, at least one in um, Unfinished Swan as well. Oh, 
Oh yeah, like the actual characters. That's cool. I think Phoebe was happy to finally have another painter in the family. I'm curious, I don't know which came first, if this is after. I would kind of assume after Unfinished Swan. That, that would make the most sense. But the music's even the same. Ow, that's so cool. When I had first played this, I had not played Unfinished Swan. I had no idea there was any sort of um, connection between the two. I didn't even realize it was the same studio at the time. <laughs> with the hat, he just looks like um, it just looks like the ending of Hereditary when he's like crowned with like the little crown because they're like he's like turned into Payman the demon. <laughs> Slightly more sweet and sincere context in this. In the magic paintbrush. Oh, wait. There we go. <laughs> That's so cool. It's really cool then, actually, after having played Unfinished Swan for the channel as well, that there's, like, that connection there with Milton. Wait, is... Is the idea... Wait, hold on. I'm just not connecting the dots. Is Milton the king in Unfinished Swan? Like, is he the one that... Did he disappear because he literally, like, painted through the doorway and was magic and went into Unfinished Swan? It makes sense, wouldn't it? Because this is already kind of a supernatural story anyway, and the and the idea of those games being connected in a kind of tangential ways. That's so interesting. I had no idea. But of course, I mean they wouldn't make so many references, I don't think, if it wasn't clear. I mean, there's paintings all over about it, so that's so funny. Oh yeah, because there's the kingdom and everything. Ow, oh, that's so it's interesting. That also informs Unfinished Swan as being searching for my brother. Then she sealed the doors. That also makes a huge difference about the idea of like the king being so isolated in the unfinished swan because it's like the idea that Milton was part of this family where Whatever everyone in the family was dying. Mom didn't want it getting out. That's so interesting. That's so cool. Sorry, I'm just still like, man, that is, I never would have thought those would be interconnected in, in such a way, but that's such a cool idea. Love it. All right, where are we headed now? Uh, oh yeah, we gotta go further up. Up, up, and away. I like to, the way the game leads you to the next section in a way that feels so intuitive is really great. Mom definitely blamed Edie, but I think Lewis blamed himself. After he graduated, he just spent more and more time in his room until Mom got him a job at the cannery. Everyone always told me to stay out of Lewis's room. Except Lewis. Let's see, how old was Lewis? Okay, 20, 22. Okay. Not that way. Otherwise, we'll be the next victim. This cool this boat built into the house itself. I, mean, I know none of this is up to code, but damn, it's cool. Oh, he would. This room smelled very, very familiar. <laughs> that part of him lived on. Oh, man. Homie was on the good kush. <laughs> he was so proud of being Indian. I think for him, it was a way to be something other than just a finch. Hmm. That's interesting, too. Like, even branching into being, like, one of, like, the, the one kid in the family going off to India and all that and like changing the landscape of the family a little bit by bringing in Louis someone from a different a culture time playing games together but he was surprisingly bad at them <laughs> he died a lot he just like me he just like me for real yeah I got his high school diploma dear mrs. Finch as Lewis's psychiatrist, I can understand your desire for an explanation. As I see it, the trouble began in January, shortly after we convinced your son to seek treatment for substance abuse. Newly sober, I believe Lewis first noticed the monotony of his daily life.
He kept working at the cannery. But he withdrew part of himself. In our sessions, I saw the same behavior. His mind began to... What, can I, can I interact with that? Wonder. Oh! I, that's so cool, I had no idea what I was looking at. I asked him to describe it. It's a minigame within a minigame. small. Imagining a labyrinth. I like that I'm playing both of these at once, because one is using the one controller. The way to this is like giving you the sense of what it is to be at a job you don't like. And the way your brain will daydream when you're just bored with this, you know, life. Bats. And toads. It's so common too for people to just feel like this is normal, to be like, oh, I'm in a job that I don't like and doesn't give me any anything in life, you know. Have not names. Well, I think the thing is interesting too is like jobs don't have to always be the most enriching. Sometimes Sometimes it's enough if a job is okay and pleasant and pays the bill. Sometimes that can be enough. But a lot of times jobs aren't even that. Or do I have to chop all the fish to be able to get them out of the way? Yeah. But he took it very seriously. I had hoped he'd find himself. I like the fish pile up and they block the little mini game. Like the idea that he has to keep doing his job if he wants to daydream. God, this game is so fucking inventive. It's just so, such brilliant storytelling. I worried about him then. Daydreaming at the cannery. I spoke with his boss. But he said Lewis had become a model employee. Methodical, tireless, focused. Like a whole new Lewis. So I let him go on. I even encouraged him. It seemed very promising at first. I like how the map expands. On the edge of a city he named Lewis Topia. He built the city up slowly, brick by brick. Then he made musicians. And songs for them to play. He talked about starting a band. And he was always humming something. Every day his imagination grew stronger. He no longer spoke at the cannery. But his chopping was as reliable as ever. Then one day it struck him that all the cheering crowds, even the stones under his feet, were all in his imagination, so he could do whatever he wished. He held an election for men, and he won. <laughs> they begged him to stay, but his mind was already wandering. It became a game for him. He'd conquer a city, then immediately push on. New Lewis here. St. Louis. He started drifting away from our reality.
Minneapolis until one day he forgot to go home from the cannery. Even as his mother pleaded with him, <sighs> the heart of Lewis kept sailing on. In Lewisburg, he heard rumors of a <laughs> I like this where you can pick him. Yeah. I'll, I'll give him a handsome queen. I like the option handsome though. Queen. Nice touch. The queen was on her own quest for Sinister Serpents. Sinister Serpents. The sound of her. Uh, ooh. electric sitar sounds cool. Is that how you say it's sitar? Electric sitar. Yeah, sitar. Okay. His chase led him to a golden palace east of the sun and west of the moon. Even then, his logic remained sound. He knew the world was all in his imagination. But he was so proud of having created it. In his own eyes, he'd become something greater than a king. For someone who'd never known success in the real world, I think it was overwhelming. And then it struck him that the real Lewis was not the one chopping salmon, but the one climbing the steps of a golden palace. My imagination is as real as my body, he told me. It was hard to argue with him. He began to forget the world we know. I think it pained him to remember Lewis, the cannery worker. He began to despise the man with a royal contempt. I still thought I could save him. Even after he said he was being crowned king over all the lands of wonder. The palace would be packed with his companions. Calico, who'd insisted on advising him. Let's say Molly, like the uh, like the little girl. Yeah. His queen waited. 
waited, holding his crown. There was only one thing left to do. Bend down his head. I think you know. Mrs. Finch, your son was a kind man who will be missed by all of us who knew him. <sighs> My brother was really cool. I wish you could have met him. Poor Lewis. <sighs> it's so... It, mm. I mean, I have so much. To, I have a lot to say because a lot to say, and yet I almost feel like there's there's little to say that I haven't already said elsewhere and many times before. But it's just as someone who struggles with mental health, who has friends who've passed away from suicide, it's a first ring of things on one token. I also, I also, I fully understand the weight of things being so heavy sometimes that it's it is often I think the it is a very brave choice to remain because life can be so hard but at the same time too i also truly do feel a sense of hope for myself and everyone i know that it i think often we can underestimate the power of what small changes we make can have when we're that desperate and that dire that um and it might seem sound silly but it's just from my own experience like even it's you know it's things like you can feel the weight of everything pushing down on you that makes you feel suicidal, that makes you feel like there's just like no way out because it feels like a mountain. Sometimes you're looking and go, I, how can I solve all 500 problems I have in my life right now that are too fucking much? We start to realize that it's not about solving 500 problems. That's not the goal. The goal is just to go, okay, if I can just solve one of these things a piece at a time, that's at least that, that at least pushes my brain slightly in the right direction, you know? And it can be as little as like, I realize how, how, um, off kilter my mental health can be even with things like i've started trying to take naps recently which is a silly thing that i used to beat myself up for because i literally was like this isn't productive this isn't do you really need to nap you're a fucking adult you know and it's and it, that sounds may sound silly to other people who would be like no that's that sounds reasonable why would you beat yourself up over that but that's how it can be you know and i think you know anyone else who struggles you know with their mental health knows that that it can be something as minor as that that you're like you treat every little concession you give to yourself, every kindness you give to yourself as a weakness or a defeat, which is so, such a backwards thing, you know, to realize that any small change you make that's a positive in any regard is a good thing. And it is a strength to be able to choose it, no matter how minor it may seem to you, the effect of it can be very dramatic. So uh, I say this a lot in the stuff that I make, but you know, be kind to yourself. It's the hardest thing in the world to do sometimes. Even, you know, we can be kind to others in ways that we can't be kind to ourselves. Because we see worth in others that we don't see reflected in the mirror. And um, even I, I still struggle with that. You know, science all. Back from Lewis's funeral, my mom told me to start packing. She waited until the day before we left to tell Edie. You know what I mean? You know, it's it can be so tough because um, even that's something that even it's tough for me a lot of times. I have to reevaluate and kind of keep myself on the right track. And that's the thing too. It's one thing where. You need support, you need encouragement, you need resources to help you, but you also have to do it for yourself and show kindness to yourself in an active way on some sort of routine. To say that, to just literally, and I mean, as silly as may seem to literally say, I love myself, I care for myself. Um, and that's even, that's a meditative practice that they do that I think seems silly to begin with, but I, I forget if there's a term for it, but um, where basically you, you, sit down for meditation it doesn't have to be very long and you think of someone that you love in your life and it, and it can be it, there the there's really no limitation on it it can be a friend a family member it can be a pet it can be it can be even someone you don't know someone who's just a kind force out in the world that you kind of hold into your thoughts you know for a moment and you and you just sort of wish you sort of wish kindness on them you say you know i wish you peace i wish you health i wish you wellness you know um and you just kind of send that kind of you know, and again, and not in a spiritual way, but just in an internal, like, you're bringing that energy into your brain and into your heart a little bit. And then after you do that, maybe a couple times with people, you do it to yourself. You say, okay, now I wish you kindness. I wish you peace. 
I wish you a wellness, you know, and you're saying that to yourself. And it's really hard to do if you're someone who struggles with a sense of self-worth and a sense of value, um, which I still do. Um, that's the hardest stage of it. And even when people are around you, that's the thing too, I you have to convince yourself that it's very easy to build yourself a narrative to talk yourself out of being kind to yourself. Like, even I've struggled with it, you know? It, it sounds, I'll look at the amount of people who have commented things and say, hey, the work you've done really brightens my day, it really makes me happy, or hey, it really feels very comfortable and familiar, it's something that really gives me, makes me feel safe, you know, enjoying your videos, your audios, or whatever. And I look at that, and on, on one token, I think, like, I'm so grateful that what I can do can give that, that feeling to someone that so often in my life I haven't felt during times where I needed it. Um, but it can be tough because sometimes even seeing that, it, your brain can be so backwards, especially if you've had self-esteem issues and they can be perpetuated by people growing up, people in your life. They can be your own family. It can be people who are mean in a work environment, school environments. But you get those notions in your head of what you, the antagonists in your life say that put you down. And so sometimes you hear that and you think, that's so cool. I'm so glad that's good for them. But obviously, they, they, oh, they just think that because they don't know me. If they knew me well enough, they wouldn't think kind things about me. That's all. Or, oh, these people who say kind things, they don't actually mean it. They're lying, you know. And it's and it sucks because that's so rarely the case. So often, people are sincere and mean it. And it takes time to be able to talk yourself out of those kind of lies because they can get really rooted in a way that you believe things about others that you don't believe about yourself. And it's and the one, one thing that helped me the most, I think, is to think internally and to reflect it and say, okay, do I think this way about other people? When I give someone a nice compliment and I say that I'm proud of them or they did a good job or I like something they made or that I think they're they're doing their best and I'm, and that's that they deserve to feel proud of themselves, am I lying to them? Because I know I'm not. I know that it's it's very rare. And even at, at the worst of being giving, even when you, if you tell someone like sort of a half truth about anything to encourage them or whatever, even that comes from a place of sincerity of wanting to say, you're, you are doing good enough no matter what, no matter mistakes you've made, no matter things that have happened and all that. That still comes from a place of sincerity. So I always have to think, okay, the way I do that to other people is sincere. So why would I put it on them that they're a liar, that someone else who's giving me compassion and kindness, that they're being insincere? Why, what reason would they have to do that if I'm if it's the way I would treat them? So um, anyway, so just to say that it's, it's tough and, it, and it's circumstances around you can affect it, but it's often less important the way you talk to yourself. Uh, but I mean, as silly as it sounds, even wake up in the morning, and whether you, even if you just want, you don't believe it at all in the moment, just internally say, I love myself, I love myself, I'm proud of myself, I'm doing my best, I'm doing my best, you know, can really make a difference to just start to unspool the way you become, you, be, you can become your own kind of a taskmaster in life. You can take the kind of emotional whippings and bruisings that you have given to you by others often you know for many of us in childhood and you do it to yourself you take those pains with you even when those people are gone because you feel like that's what you deserve you feel like well this person wouldn't have done it if i something about me wasn't bad or wasn't wrong you know um so it's one reason why in the position that I have now with a bit of an audience and going forward, it's always been very, very important to me to be able to talk about these things very candidly. Because I always think, you know what, if I had just heard some of these notions from someone and just to be able to hear, okay, what I'm feeling is not strange. You know, if you can listen to me right now and you struggle with self-worth and value and feeling like there's any meaning to your life or any, or any value in it while you're searching for meaning, um, just know that it's, it's not just you. I still feel it. I still struggle with it. No matter, you know, if you listen to this now, I'm sure what I've got like around 10,000 subscribers now. And I'm, just, you know, my community is growing to be a slightly larger and all that. I'm becoming more of a f full, full scale content creator. And I still struggle with it. And I'm sure I will still struggle with it in the future. I'm sure the Dom in the future, years from now, who maybe has 100,000 subscribers or more or whatever milestone it might be. Is probably that that person that me is probably still struggling too. But all I can hope for, for the future of me is that I'm continue to do the work that I'm trying to do now, to build up a tolerance for that kind of kindness and an intolerance for those lies that I tell myself. Because that's what you have to do. You have to build up a callus against 
the kind of unkindness and cruelty we do to ourselves, you know? So, um, anyway. I was gonna say sorry for being heavy, but this is a heavy game. It's about trauma. It's about pain. It's about how life can weigh you down. And I think this game is very indicative for how many of us feel when life... The intensity of life can feel like a curse, even though it's not. It's The, the world isn't conspiring against any of us. It's, it's not, I, no matter how you may feel. But once again, our brains are very good at... Cons we want structure. We want a narrative to be a reason. Because it's easier to believe that, to be able to say, okay, all these bad things have happened to me, all these challenging things or difficulties came into my life because I had no choice, because it was like some cosmic curse or whatever. Our brain, that's easier for us to process than the difficulty of saying... This just happened, and there was no meaning behind it. There was no purpose. No one was against me. Life just is tough sometimes. It's just punishingly difficult. And all I can choose is what I choose to give to myself and those around me who I choose to allow in my life. That's why I tell people, you know, I always encourage people that setting boundaries is so important in life, not because... You shouldn't set boundaries purely due to discomfort. If you have a spat with your friend, cutting them off under the guise of a boundary is cowardly, especially if that's a real friend and someone who means a lot to you. But setting a boundary over someone who you realize, this is someone, you know, who does not respect me, does not care for my well-being because they don't even care for their own, you know? And that's usually sort of the test for it is to go, does this person take any of this advice for themselves? Do they listen? Do they show compassion? Do they, are they trying? And that's the thing too, no one has to be perfect, but you have to look at someone and say, is this person trying to be someone open and kind and compassionate? And if they are, if that's what they want to be, that alone usually speaks to the fact that they're usually someone who's on the right path and someone in life who's worth making space for. So um, anyway, you know, sometimes I feel weird taking a moment to say this. I feel like I just, I, I'm a gamer. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I, I, I'm a voice actor. I do silly videos. I make jokes and all that. But it, anytime this stuff comes up, I always just think to myself, I think if there's one person listening who on a day that otherwise might have been too much for them to bear can hear a silly YouTuber, content creator like me, just talk about this stuff for a little bit and feel a little bit more seen and a little more heard and a little more understood... And if you're a little more welcome, then it's okay. If you're hurting, it's okay. If you're in a tough place, um, and that it doesn't mean you're weak, it doesn't mean you've made some, you've done, you know done something too wrong. It doesn't mean you deserve it either. I think that's the most important thing. It's just because you're hurting. It's not what you deserve. Even if it is the reality, even if you are hurting, if you are self-inflicting, even on an emotional level, you know, harm upon yourself, you know, um, you deserve better than that. You know, and, and you are capable of, you are capable of being kinder to yourself and you deserve the benefits of that. You deserve to be able to look forward to a future you that gets to reap all the benefits of your own compassion, your growth and all this stuff that's really hard, especially because I know a lot of my audience, I know a lot of you are pretty young. I'm not that old, I'm 28 at the time of making this video, but, um, and many of you are just, just a little bit younger. I know a lot of my audience is early twenties, um, but that's the, one of the toughest points in life because let's be real. You haven't been an adult for long. Let's be real. You've been, if you've been on your own, and some of, some of you, again, have not even made the step to be fully on your own yet. And, that, and I understand that because life's so fucking difficult. So I look at that and go, you need to be extra kind to yourself for the next 10 years at least. And beyond that, but specifically these years because they're really difficult. And you're trying to find your way in a world that moves very fast and can be very unkind. Um, so surrounding yourself and your life with things that inspire you and give you just joy and happiness and all that because that's more important than something having quote-unquote meaning or significance is does it just bring out any sort of spark in you and help you does it feel easier to push away those lies when you're around the right kind of people when you're consuming the right kind of art when you're engaging with the right kind of things regardless of whether or not they're important or whether they make money or whether whatever that may be you know so um, anyway that's my long spiel we'll keep going here um, but on the tone of that, especially that this game does deal with not only death, but suicide. And it can be so easy to get so lost in a fantasy world saying, man, if I only had this, then, and then by contrast, looking at your own life and to realize your life doesn't have to have all those things. And what's the deception is if you had all of those things that you fantasize about, there's a good chance you would still be carrying this weight with you if you don't deal with it now versus is again, this is not to say, I think a lot of people being like, money doesn't buy happiness. Money does not inherently buy happiness, but money and wealth and security, it buys a foundation with which you don't, you have less to worry about, less to weigh you down. So it does make a huge difference. But that said, if you don't do the work now to give yourself some kindness and work out these self-sabotaging behaviors, you will find when that 
monetary or social kind of foundation and security appears, you'll still have the weight with you. Um, and I see it. I know people who are middle-aged, who I, I know in my life, who are, you know, friends of family, family members, whatever, who still carry weight like that with them even into their middle age, even into their older years. And they wonder why they still have trouble communicating, why they still have trouble finding happiness, why they still feel volatile towards themselves. And that's why. So it doesn't go away and it doesn't happen without some deliberate effort, but it can be done. And it's not that hard. It just takes time. It's a consistency thing. Just like exercising a physical muscle, it's exercising a mental and emotional muscle to build kindness in and strengthen it. So that way that becomes so much more of uh, a force in your in your brain and in your life to be able to quell and push back the negative thoughts and realize no, these are the things that are untrue. These are the lies or the things to say that I'm not worthy of a decent, happy, connected, you know, uh, creative life. So um, anyway, all right, let's keep going here. That just was, um, I don't know. It was on my heart to bring that up. Like I said, if, if that helps even one person at a time where they need it or a time where I'm someone- I'm not sure if she wanted to make it easier or harder. <sighs> You know, a time where someone might come back to that, this little bit of me saying this, because it's maybe it's what you need to hear when no one else is readily available to say it, then I'll then I'll be glad that I've said it and it will have worth been worth the time. All right, anyway. I wish we'd stayed. But I understand why we left. My mom ended up leaving everything behind. What happened that night had been coming for a long time. Maybe it should have come sooner. But it had to end one way or another. All that's left now is to tell you about that last night. That whole last day, Edie just watched us pack and didn't say a word. Until supper, when she raised her glass and said, to our final night together, and all our final nights apart. Grandma, you know what I said about alcohol. Some of your medications are very Edith, specific- I left a present for you in the hallway. Why don't you go open it? The grown-ups have to argue now. I'm sorry, you're right. We're all leaving tomorrow. Let's just enjoy our last- I'm not leaving. Edith, you're excused. The power had been shut off that morning, but Edie always had plenty of candles. When my mom sailed the library, I don't think she knew about the other entrance. Or that Edie had a key to it. The thing you're afraid of isn't going to end when you leave the house. Edith has a right to know these stories. My children are dead because of your stories. I think it's best if Edith and I leave tonight. We'll have the nursing home send a van for you in the morning, okay? Dear Edith, there's so many stories I wish I could tell you. But there's only time for one. This is about what happened on the night you were born. That night, the tide went way, way out. It was the first and last time I ever saw the old house aground. There'd been an earthquake out in the middle of the ocean. They called it the lowest tide in a thousand years. God, it smelled 
awful. You know, I've seen that house every day of my life. But I never thought I'd go back to it. When the fog rolled in, I lost my way. I got turned around. I started seeing things. Things I'd forgotten had ever existed. When I saw them, they felt like old friends. That night, a lot of things came back to me. Or maybe I came back to them. Things I can't explain, but that I need you to try and- Edith, what are you doing in here? It's mine. Edith! Mom, you're gonna rip it! Let go! I kicked and screamed, but... Mom dragged me to the car. I never saw Great-Grandma Edie again. The next morning, the van came to pick her up, but she was already gone. After that, we moved around a lot. We both tried to make the best of it. A few years went by. My mom didn't like to talk about it. But she started getting sick a lot. <coughs> the rest happened pretty quickly. She got better for a while. And then she didn't. And then I was alone. last finch left alive. Until I found out about you. I'm still not sure what to tell you about all this. If we lived forever, maybe we'd have time to understand things. But as it is, I think the best we can do is try to open our eyes appreciate how strange and brief all of this is. This journal was supposed to be for you. But now I hope you'll never see it. I just want to meet you and tell you all these stories myself. But I guess if you're reading this now, Things didn't work out that way. This is where your story begins. I'm sorry I won't be there to see it. It's a lot to ask, but I don't want you to be sad that I'm gone. I want you to be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. Good luck. Oh, I forgot about that. I forgot we're not Edith. Oh, oof.
Oof. I love them using all the childhood pictures of all the creative team. Oh, shit. <laughs> it's a hard game to get to the end of, because, like, usually when you get to the end, it's like, oh, man. Wasn't that so much fun, everyone? Oh, what a, what a good time. And it's like, this one's like, it's so good. It's a brilliant, brilliant game. One of my absolute all-time favorites. Just absolutely amazing. But it's just, it's just heavy. It's heavy and it's sad and it's bittersweet. But there's something, there's something kind of compassion underneath it that I like. It's not, because this game could be much more sort of um, salacious and trying to really get the tears out of you you make it much more brutal and shocking and they really chose not to do that even despite it being centered around just this endless amount of death um oh yeah here's there's the flying ship from um from uh, unfinished one i did again i had no idea these were such a double feature of these two so that's a good one too if you want two amazing small games then that is these two are just absolutely brilliant unfinished swan a little bit more of a delicate fairy tale and this one a little bit more heavy obviously so um but man it's it's just so brilliant it's just i this is one reason why i'm like i want more shorter emotional games you know i think it, it gets exhausting when so many games are competing in scale you know where they're all trying to be like oh well like the our game is 150 hours long and it's like okay that's good for some games again i'm playing like Baldur's gate 3 and that game's fucking brilliant but that's also daunting as a gamer with when life is a lot you know and it's like the dedication of time that i don't have like i did when i was a kid so it's cool to have a game that like this that is takes you know maybe a couple hours probably a little less if you're just going through it on your own terms and gives you such a spectrum of emotions there's so much good writing and storytelling it's so it's so interesting and sincere you know it's just it's ah ah it just it just gets me right in the right in the feels you know so anyway i'm curious to know what you guys think of it you know what parts impacted you the most you know if there's any specific storylines that really stood out to you as we journey through the family you know and everything they've gone through so um and i, I don't know i'm not sure even what else to say about it mostly because i think um it does such a good job it, it, it does all of its emotions so well that I have very, I have really almost nothing to critique about it. Like most of these games, I have some give and take to it, but this one, I really don't. I think it's fucking brilliant and ingenious. And I think there's, it packs in more creative storytelling into a couple hours of gameplay than, you know, there's some whole fucking TV shows with, you know, season after season that don't even manage to get to the emotional kind of, depths that this does so it's uh it's brilliant it's, it's it's there's not much to say about it it's also again it's a nice one too if you want a game where maybe kind of more intense gameplay is not your thing i love it as a piece of diverse storytelling um, and by that i mean that you know like not all games have to be punishing they don't have to have to be difficult they don't always have to be a souls like you know and those games are great too i love many of them but it's so nice to have a game that's just meant to be an immersive engaging emotional experience you know and i think it's interesting i think maybe it's one reason why i like games so much as someone who does audio role plays because i think the power of audio role plays that i think is still underappreciated as a format and as a medium that i think will become more popular over time is that uh audio role plays they're immersive so you get to feel the emotional connection because you get to it's you get to be the person you know what i mean so um same thing with games like this where you get to live in the shoes of someone else and this whole first person experience um oh that's right i forgot you can you can replay certain chapters of the story to be able to experience them and see if you you know missed anything or there's anything else to explore so um oh man it's, it's so good that's so interesting so thoughtful it's so sincere and this is something i see too i see um one thing I think gets critiqued sometimes, that thing is just so weird to me, is I've seen, I'll see this with movies and different forms of storytelling, where um, something will get critiqued as not being good because uh, it'll be too sincere or too... I remember seeing a review for the movie... Um, uh, oh, goodness, hold on. I want to make sure... It's, it's uh, the one... About the the time travel family with... Uh, let's see. Yeah, that okay. I'm, I'm on... I had the right name in my head. About Time. 
uh, which of course is the one with Donald Gleason and uh, Bill Nye and a bunch of bunch of great cast members about a family where the men in the family have the ability to um, go back in time with certain limitations. But that's one that has it's very uh, very emotionally sincere. It's very, and I'm seeing some reviews that were like, it's a little bit saccharine, you know, it's a little bit overly sweet. And I'm like, overly sentimental. And I'm like, yeah, God forbid, you know, because <laughs> it's because I'm like, it's, and there's difference between fake sincerity and not, you know what I mean? So like, I think that's one thing where it's, it's nice to have a game like this that is not trying to puncture it with jokes. It's not trying to be something that's not, it's trying to be something very, just very sincerely, just open hearted about the message that it has, you know, about a difficult a series of difficult subjects that it deals with. So um, anyway, I love it. I adore it. Please play it for yourself. You know, uh, play their other games. I love, um, you know, th I think the studio just amazing work. Um, and because uh, it, it was it's Giant Sparrow is the team that put this together. And uh, I think they're just they are making such interesting things. I need to, I haven't checked what they're making lately i'll have to keep an eye out because i definitely want their one studio that i want to play everything that they make because they just seem so innovative in the way they tell a story and find such unusual kind of ways kind of like i talk about remedy as a studio who made alan wake and control and i love a studio that just is pushing the boundaries you know and is trying to find different ways to present stories i think it's very exciting and it's a very exciting time to be to be around and to be alive and to be enjoying stories being told in, in more diverse ways than ever before in human history um, you know, that's what we're living through right now. So anyway, I hope you like that, guys, or at least enjoy it as much as you can. Um, I got to experience it for yourself. Um, and hopefully, you know what? Hopefully you did shed some tears. Hopefully you did have some some strong feelings. That's good for us. You know, too often we bottle stuff up and that's very unhealthy for all of us. So I hope this was a good emotional journey. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you guys think. I'm always curious to see your reaction, especially on a more uh, more serious title like this one. And um, I'm going to try to find more of these smaller games to sprinkle in every now and then and maybe some ones like this where I can do a full game all in one sitting because this was really fun it was really nice getting to do something all the way through and not have to split it up too much for you guys so hopefully you guys enjoyed that too to be able to just have the experience that I had start to finish completely unbroken so um and you know we'll see what's next I'll, I'll let you know next time I find a really sad depressing game that I need you to come with me so I can cry about it and talk while I'm doing it so <laughs> anyway thank you all so much for watching and listening my name is Dominic and I will see you next time. Bye.